two, one, Q. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for your time and welcome back to ADEX Pixel Virtual Expo. Um, so today our session is um, one from uh, Scuba 101 and uh, the title is called um, the Cave Explorer Roundtable. So today we have a, I must say, um, very exciting um, group of um, explorers uh, who has ventured caves all over the world. And um, I'm just going to start and wing it just to introduce our moderator. Um, and then our moderator will then uh, introduce the rest of the panelists. Um, so our moderator for today is um, Julian Fortin. Uh, he's morning. the owner of technical... Oh, sorry, Julian. You want to give it a wave a little bit? <laughs> uh, so Julian is actually the owner of Technical Diving India. Uh, he's a party course director and a tech instructor trainer, TDI and a IANTD technical and cave diver instructor, and a global underwater explorer fundamental instructor. So he's currently splitting between India and Mexico. And uh, aside from his massive love for mangoes, uh, Julian, <laughs> Julian enjoys participating in projects uh, in different areas of the world. Julian, over to you. Okay, so um, good morning, everyone. I think we have a very diverse panel today of people being in different time zones. So good morning to Jill, Sam, uh, Brian, if I'm not mistaken, and good evening to everybody else, I believe. <laughs> so um, today what uh, we're going to do, basically, we're going to try to just have a discussion among like-minded people uh, sharing a single love for caves. So we're all explorers, but uh, more importantly, we're all in love with caves, I believe. And so I don't really want us to have a very specific topic or a very technical topic or a very specialized subject on caves, but just use our own experiences to share our love of caves with the audience. Bearing in mind that a lot of the people listening to us today might not be cave diver. I believe that everyone who is tuning in today has an interest in scuba diving, but might not be cave divers or might not be explorers. So uh, we decided to basically do this conversation in the form of a little show and tell. So each one of us going to have a couple of pictures, up to three pictures, just to use as a cue, to use as a guideline to discuss um, how we love cave diving and how diverse of a subject it is, how many different things it's touching. So thank you all of you guys for participating. And I'll introduce each of you um, when it's time for you to present your pictures so that we don't um, create an information overload for the audience. So um, right now, I'm going to start with a couple of pictures to explain a little bit, a couple of aspects that I enjoy about cave diving. So if you give me the time to share my screen right now. Um, can everybody see my picture right now? Yeah. All right. So basically, my three pictures are connected to something that I heard when I actually started scuba diving, uh, you know, a decade and a half ago. And when I started diving, basically, my first instructor in Sri Lanka told me something which at the time I found really silly. He told me that scuba diving was about going place, meeting people and doing things. And I was like, this sounds like a stupid slogan. <laughs> and the more I dive, the more I realize it's actually completely that, you know. And so actually diving is about going places, meeting people and doing things. And um, this is, for example, a picture that I took in Yucatan on an exploration project. And you can see that I'm dangling on a rope here in the middle of nowhere. And to me, when you're far away from everything while exploring, that's where I feel the closest to everything that matters in my life. So it's an interesting thing is that going places far away makes me feel closer to what matters in my life. So the first picture is to illustrate the fact that to me, cave diving is about going places where I would have never been otherwise. And as a traveler and as someone who is very much in love with this planet, I think it's a very important point of cave diving. Now, the second picture is about basically meeting people. And I know this doesn't look like people and those are not dead divers. Those are basically um, monk seal bones. So um, I participated in a project, in a paleontology project in Sardinia. Uh, we're, we're working with a university, with an Italian university, to document monk seal bones, prehistorical ones. And what I really enjoyed about that project is that I arrived in Sardinia, where I'd never been, and I met a group of people I'd never met before, and, you know, some of them not even speaking the same language. 
And in a matter of hours, we're able to work together on a project because what connected us was that love for the cave, was that curiosity, the fact that we all wanted to see something we hadn't seen before. And so cave diving for me is also about meeting people. It's about having a group of diverse people from very different backgrounds. We had in the group, we had a couple of professional divers. We also had a dentist, we had a pilot, we had an art collector, all very experienced cave divers working together on that paleontology project. And obviously, when you go people, when you go places and you meet people, what you want to do is to do things. And so that's what my third picture is all about. It's on a project I'm currently working on in uh, Mexico. It's a mapping project. And it's just about the fact that you keep going to the cave with your little drawing pad and make a drawing by hand and, you know, start digitalizing it afterwards. So it's basically going into the cave to bring back data for the outside world, to share your love for the cave outside. And so to me, those three points, going places I wouldn't have been otherwise, meeting people I wouldn't have met otherwise, and doing incredible stuff that I didn't know existed 20 years ago, you know, like mapping an underwater cave. If you had told me when I was 15, I would be mapping an underwater cave, I'd be like, what's an underwater cave? Why would I map it? So for me, those three points is really what matters to me in my exploration and diving. And again, I believe that each one of us might have very different reasons to go into the cave. I don't think there are good or bad reasons, but I hope that everybody on that panel can agree that the place, the people, and the action is really what matters. And to see a little bit uh, what matters to our next panelist, I would like to introduce Jill. Now, introducing Jill is somewhat redundant. I mean, I don't think you need much of an introduction, Jill, but you know, you're Canadian, you're a cave diver, an explorer, a writer, a filmmaker, you're a member of the Explorers um, Club, you are the author of a couple of books that actually, you know, were a milestone in my own diving, like The Basics of River Diving, The Essentials of Cave Diving, and Into the Planet, which is actually on my kitchen table right now. I'm not lying to you, you know. <laughs> and um, you have inspired a lot of divers. You've included, including all the divers on this panel. And I would like to know from you what um, cave diving and exploration is all about, what you get out of that, and what you would like to share with the audience. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, I brought some unusual stuff to share, a little bit different than some of the other cave diving environments. And I'm just going to open up my screen so that you can see it. I'm just going to close you guys off for a moment. Um, so, yeah, I brought some really different images. This is inside a volcanic lava tube in the Canary Islands. So uh, if you can imagine, like, lava flowing down the side of a uh, volcano, um, when it starts to cool, the outer sheath of the lava hardens, but the core keeps flowing like a fire hose. And so as this thing cools, you end up with this tubular passageway. But what's really cool about this spot is this is under the seafloor. So when the lava came pouring down the Monte Corona volcano in Lanzarote, um, it hit the ocean, created a gas explosion and kept on going. And, um, and now today, there's a whole lot of seafloor on top of this lava tube. And what you're actually looking at in this shot is a sand mountain. And this has literally created one grain of sand at a time. So there's a pinhole in the ceiling. And one grain of sand drops down through that pinhole from the ocean floor above and has created this thing that is almost like, uh, you know, the sand in the bottom of an egg timer. And this mountain of sand inside the lava tube is 80 feet high. And we were actually um, sort of coring into the sand mountain to um, get samples that had uh, new species that hadn't been described by science before. So pretty cool place. Um, then the second slide I brought is a completely different cave diving experience. This is in an iron ore mine in Canada. Uh, the water temperature is about, um, it's about zero, so it's cold. Um, this space is used to be pumped dry so that they could mine ore from inside. And this was used in the shipbuilding efforts in World War II. Um, and in fact, attracted U-boats uh, to what is now our you know, Canadian shores. The U-boats actually sunk ships just offshore from this mine. Um, in order to disrupt the flow of iron ore from the Bell Island mine. So we have to use cave diving procedures to you know, swim through this place that's like nine square miles of passages, 1,800 wow. feet deep. Yeah. And what you're looking at here is, is 
underneath the silt on the floor, there's actually railway tracks. So we find, you know, full sort of um, ore carts full of iron ore. And we find and follow all of the, you know, pipe works, pumps, and there's machinery everywhere. And on the wall in the upper left of this photo, you'll see a little white cross. And that is a location where a miner would have lost his life. There's 107 people that have died in this mine during the course of mining operations. And so we try to find out what the story is behind each of these locations that is now memorialized with you know insignias on the wall or or we know of the location just from maps and things and then the third photo i brought is like completely the other side of the spectrum this is a project um, that brian k cook was on with me he's my dive partner in a lot of this this was back in the 90s um this was uh you know one of the sort of early uh really big um, expeditions in cave diving. This was on the United States Deep Caving Team Wakulla 2 project where we made the first ever three-dimensional map of any subterranean space, dry or wet. And it used rebreathers and this digital mapping device that helped us make this accurate map. And we did some you know, pretty crazy um, long dives um, with, you know, up to 17 hours of decompression after, you know, five hour bottom times close to 300 feet deep. So some you know, pretty crazy long dives, but uh, a, a pivotal project, I think, for both both uh, Brian and I in our cave diving careers. So that's what I brought to show and tell. <laughs> well, that's, that's fascinating. Thank you very much. I think it ties in really well to the idea that, you know, diving takes you places where you would have never been now. I mean, like, you know, going to mm -hmm. that mine and I mean, it must have been really incredible on the emotional level to see those crosses on the wall and so on. So Yeah, it's kind of like wreck diving inside a cave <laughs> with all the history that, that comes with that, you know. Yeah. It's funny because sometimes you use people saying wrecks are like a, a metal cave, you know, and now again you have a connection mm -hmm. to, to like a mine like this. It's quite fascinating. Okay, so did, did you use that hourglass as your bottom timer, that big pile of sand? Or did yeah, you <laughs> that'd be a really long like geologic bottom timer. <laughs> You said you had a lot of deep questions, so you know that's probably all right. Okay, good. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Jill. That's mm -hmm. um, that's perfect. So um, we're going to move on. Again, I'm very happy if any other panelist wants to tune in on any other point. But um, moving on to the second panelist in no particular order, I would like to ask uh, Robin. Hello, Robin. Um, to basically share a couple of pictures with us. So Hi. Robin is a um, French technical diver and cave diver. You're based in Indonesia, if I'm not mistaken, and you have participated Correct. in exploration projects a bit everywhere in that area, from Sumatra to Papua. And you're also one of the founders of the Indonesia Cave Diving Association, am I right? Just a member, actually, not a founder. Okay, and um, but you have a background in computer science, and you're the owner now of Sulawesi Dive Trek, which is the first technical diving facility in the area, yeah? Cor that's correct. Excellent. Could you tell us a little bit more about that area of the world that a lot of us might not be familiar with in terms of um, cave yeah, diving, sure. please? Sure. So um, I start, started cave diving exploration for a reason that's maybe a little bit less heroic. Actually, in 2016, I wanted to move from Bali, where, where I was living, uh, and do some cave diving in the area. And I've been looking in information on the internet and haven't found anything. So. I told myself like, oh, such a big country, which is like 5,000 kilometers large, there must be some cave. So I started to gather some information and found that uh, we had like around 150,000 kilometers of limestone uh, all around the country. So I kind of started to, to look around and decided to move to this particular place of uh, Indonesia, which is Sulawesi. Can you see the map now? We can, yeah, we can. Okay. So um, I moved there in September 2016. Uh, before that, a few divers already explored the, the country in cave diving. So a French team did a few scientific expedition. I heard that Liz Rogers was, I've been diving in time, Timor and Mark Crane and Ed Stockdale have been in Sulawesi area before also. Uh, but I kind of moved there alone with my backpack and just see what, uh, what basically I could go, I could find. Uh, so when I arrived there in the Bhutan area, I started explored. I met some local people around that basically helped me 
uh, the whole time driving me, showing me place. And on the course of a few months, I've explored more than 100 caves and found quite a few systems that would be uh, nice to dive. Um, so I kept exploring since then. Uh, and in October 2019, I, so as you said, I opened, opened the first cave diving center in the country. And so far, I've been basically sharing my time be between exploring and teaching cave diving. So here you can see on the map uh, all the cave I found in the area. Uh, so actually, not all the cave I've yeah, not all the cave have been found by me because and by the meantime, uh, some local divers started to cave dive also, and a mate of me from Thailand also came and did a lot of exploration. So that's the, all the cave we have in the area. Um, so we can see here in Wakatobi and here in Bhutan area. Um, so the cavities we have there are very diverse. Uh, we have some gypsum cave, we have some uh, very shallow maze, we have some very deep cave. The deepest one we explored with Paul, uh, we've been around 75 meters with CCR. We have very, very deep sinkhole, the kind of sinkhole you can find uh, in the Sanctum movie. I guess everybody saw, saw it here. Yes. And, and recently I happened to find uh, what I would call my biggest discovery in the, so let me just share my uh, picture. Uh, okay. Can you see it now? Uh, almost. I think it's coming on the screen right now. Okay. Uh, let me, let me, I'm supposed to be the IT guy here. So, <laughs> yeah, here. Okay, here. Can you, can you see it? I still see your Google Earth right now. Now I see your picture. Perfect. Okay. Okay. So this is one of the, the cave I, I was talking about, the, the longest cave uh, I found in the area, which is around four kilometers long so far. Uh, I've only been explored in open circuit, so it's very shallow at the beginning and start to get deeper at the end. And I had the chance to dive with uh, Pete Misley recently that took all this nice picture. So here you can see some of the speleothem, uh, and you can see that the water is very, very clear and the volume are very, very large. Um, so yeah, I would say that uh, Indonesia is a pretty interesting destination when it comes to cave diving. So of course, of uh, you all explorers, so you all know that in the 200 plus point I've shown you, probably like five or six percent are actually uh, uh, divable. The all all other were mostly like mud and and dark place that you wouldn't never want to come back. Um, so yeah, um, let me show you another picture from Pete. So this is on the inside of the cave where the, the cave starts to, be, to, to become deeper and deeper. Um, on this part of the world, the cave are mostly used by people to uh, pump fresh water and also as place where they can do their laundry, where they can meet, where the kids come to play. So here you can see a cave in Wakatobi. So it's really like the cenotes. So you have these uh, stairs when you can go and people just chill out in this space. So yeah, it's very, very nice. People, they are very nice, they're very helpful. They're not so much uh, uh, mystic related to the cave. So people let us go everywhere. The only issue I see now, and that's something I've been talking about two days ago, it's the pollution related to human activity on this cave. And I will show you a small example of it. Uh, here you can see in one of the caves, wow. uh, uh, a roof. So you cannot really realize it, but the, the layer of the plastic is more than one meter. So you can basically swim inside it and yeah, just be in, a, in an ocean of plastic. So the, the, the pollution problem is definitely not only in the ocean, it's basically any water body we can find on this planet. So, but I guess for you, oh, yeah. sorry, I guess for you, Robin. I mean, like uh, you, you're diving in an area where cave diving has not been a thing before. You're one of the mm -hmm. people opening up the place for cave diving, which comes with its own challenges, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that what you're telling about, you know, the, the collaboration with the local people and explaining what you're doing and so on is, is probably extremely important. I've, I've had the experience myself in some areas in India or in Chiapas. 
And what do you do exactly to, you know, when you're talking to people, you said they're very welcoming, they let you dive. Do you show them the pictures of the plastic in the cave? Do you try to explain to them the importance of not polluting their own water yeah. supply? What do you do to collaborate with the community on that? So basically when you go there and want to explore a cave, the, the process is to go ask the head of the village before and the local right. community. There's always people around. So you ask them, yeah, can I go there? Is that something I should know? And yeah, people are usually very welcoming. And at the end, as a, I mean, it's not mandatory, but it's like, a, you know, they, they want to see what's happening. So I'll always have my GoPro and show them a few pictures. Of course. And I must add that now there's a local community of cave divers also in Wakatobi and Bhutan. So they mm -hmm. do a lot also to, to promote the, the activity as a, a potential for tourism. So we're all working together. And I think the, I always give the example of Mexico uh, that managed to, to use the, 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 cave, the cave system as an asset for their, their tourist industry. And they're really, really eager to, to develop it. The only thing now lacking there is a proper infrastructure and uh, the access is still sure. a little bit tricky. But yeah, I mean, we're all working together and so far. I, it's, think, it's I think it's great. You know, for me, the importance of seeing that cave diving and the caves don't belong to the cave, dive, the cave divers, but to the local people and the importance of establishing a very respectful and you know mutually beneficial relationship to the communities is a very important one. So that, that's a very interesting aspect of your work. Thank you very much for sharing, Robin. I really You're appreciate welcome. that. Thank you and I'm uh, actually looking forward to meeting you in Asia when I can travel from Mexico again back to India. So looking forward you're to that. All right. You're all welcome here. Anytime. Well, and you're welcome to pass by also India. We could do a couple of things together. Excellent. Okay. So thank you. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, that actually ties in very well to our next panelist, Bruce, because Bruce also has been um, basically working in areas where no cave diving was happening before. And so Bruce probably met uh, with a couple of challenges on his own, trying to go introduce cave diving to places. So um, Bruce, very quickly, is an ex-US Marine Corp. Um, you used to work as a combat engineer, if I'm not mistaken, and now you're yes, based correct. in Thailand. Yes. And you're based in Thailand for a couple of decades already, so you didn't just uh, arrive yesterday. Over 45 years now. Well, there you go. So two and a half <laughs> decades, that's, that's pretty good, you know. And uh, you've worked on a lot of technical and cave exploration projects in Thailand, in the Philippines. Uh, you were also involved in the rescue efforts for the Thai soccer team trapped in a cave in 2018, if I'm not wrong. Yes, it was. And um, along with also Ben, who is going to be one of our panelists, and you're yep. the owner of uh, Deep Tech Thailand, who organizes training and expeditions in Thailand, Philippines, and all over the region, right? Yes, correct. Excellent. So um, could you tell us a little bit more about your exploration project, the challenges you've met going into places less traveled, and share a couple of pictures with us? I believe your pictures are going to be shared. you sharing your pictures yourself. Is that fine? Yeah, or is uh, Nora going to do it? All right, cool. So there you go. Okay, uh, I think most of my time since I've been over here, uh, even though I live in, in Thailand, I spend a lot of the time traveling back and forth to the Philippines. Uh, it's sometimes even six months of the year that I'm over there, I'm either exploring caves or exploring wrecks and stuff like that. Uh, I like to go down South Philippines, down around uh, Samar, and it's even today, it's probably like Mexico was 20 years ago. It's uh, so far behind and stuff like that. Uh, a lot of people ask me to take to do the Cade courses over there and stuff like that, but I usually refer them over here and stuff uh, because just the logistics and stuff like that, it's uh, not very easy to get to the caves. There's a lot of caves in Samar. Uh, one trip we did in seven days, we did seven virgin caves, and uh, it's the number of caves over there is countless and stuff like that. Mm. Uh, in this picture that you see here, we were, I think we had 28 borders, and we'd actually had gone into the jungle for five days, and I think we explored about five different caves, and we'd actually were there the year before, and uh, we you know, we found one cave. Usually I'll, I'll do a trip and I'll pick a group of caves and stuff like that and I'll go explore them all. And, but, you know, even if I find a good cave, you know, I'll always move on to the next one. And then the following year, I'll come back more and I'll, I come back more prepared. I bring more tanks, I bring the compressors, and I bring more equipment and stuff like that. 
we'd actually found this one key that had gone, it was, it just seemed like it would be endless, but it, it was not easy to get to because we had to get all these quarters. I think we had like 18 tanks, the compressors, and it's not like it was easy to get to. It was like a bus ride, of like a couple hour bus ride, then uh, going in long tail boats and white water rapids and stuff like that. Then we get to a village and we, then we got to hike into the jungles for a couple hours and stuff like that. And we set up a base camp out there and uh, we would just start exploring all the different caves and stuff that are in the area. Uh, we've gone to this one cave and uh, it's actually pretty, when you're going through the, the cave and stuff like that, there's nothing but all these bats flying around and stuff like that. And we get to the open area where the cave is in that. And, uh, we had gone in there and explored the cave and kept pushing in and stuff like that. Uh, I'd still like to go back again. The, the cave just keeps going on and on, but it, it always seems like I have new projects coming up over there and stuff like that. Uh, I just don't know which one to do next. There's so many different caves over there I want to uh, go to. Uh, lately, it's, I got a bunch of uh, uh, different wrecks and stuff like that, but it's so many over there, I don't even know where to go next. <laughs> okay, excellent. Um, well, that, that's very interesting. For me, that relates very well to know what Robin has been saying about going to new places and so on. And you said you had also difficulties, you know, because you go sometimes to areas where security is an issue, correct? Uh, yeah, I've actually, I've been down, even down in uh, uh, the very south of Mindanao. And that's where they actually have the most troubles and stuff like that. Uh, you know, I always organize uh, things. You got to, you know, you should find a guide in the local area uh, so they know which, uh, you know, you, gotta, you always got to see the head of the brown guy and stuff like that, the, the village, uh, head of the village and stuff like that. And you got to get the permits and stuff like that. And, you know, I knew Mindanao was not exactly was South Kota Bato. It's not a very safe place. But it was just like, you know, they kept telling me, okay, it's safe, it's safe, and something. And it, I was like, okay, I says, well, you know, I've been in dangerous situations before, but it's like, okay, I'm, I'm always willing to take a certain amount of risk. It's like, okay, I'd organized it. They helped supply us with trucks and people to help us out, the guys and porters and stuff like that. And even when I got to the airport, uh, I had like five guys with machine guns. So I said, well, I think we'll be safe this time. You know, like five guys to nine guys with machine guns and uh, take this to all the different caves and stuff. But uh, I, I don't do too many more trips down here. That was, it was pretty much exciting enough, but uh, I should like to stick with Samara where it's a little bit more comfortable. All right, that, that's quite fascinating. Actually, I'd like to ask a question to Jill about that, because Jill, you've been doing exploration all over the world for quite a bit of time right now. And there is one point in what Bruce is saying that I find interesting and that really relates to my own experience, that very often people are scared of cave diving, but they don't know about cave diving. But in my experience, most of the danger is happening outside of the cave. Like I get much more problems in life at the surface than I get in the cave, you know, generally. And very often the logistics and doing everything to get to the cave is sometimes more dangerous than, than going, you know, than actually being in the water. Would you, would you agree with that? That sometimes the logistics and sometimes just driving there is the most dangerous part of the dive? Uh, yeah. I mean, I think if you're, you know, a rule follower, a protocol follower, which we obviously are, we wouldn't be here today. Um, then I think almost anything that can happen underwater can be easily prevented with good training, the right equipment, and an appropriate approach to risk assessment, definitely. Absolutely. And so very often I find that, you know, what we don't control is happening outside of the cave, you know, the logistics to get there, the drive there sometimes, you know, I know that in India, driving my motorcycle to the place where I dive is usually the most dangerous part of the dive, right? So that kind of thing. Yeah, I flipped a van once on the way to project, <laughs> spilled my gear all over the highway. <laughs> there you go. And there is, we don't have SOPs for that, do we? <laughs> no. All right. Well, thank you very much, Jill, and thank you very much, Bruce. That's very well, interesting to see how complicated me. the logistics around can be. And again, the, the relationship with the authorities and the community seems to be really essential for what we do. So considering cave diving is. has been considering cave diving has been connected to a community at large is very a very important point to me. Um, we're gonna move on to the next panelist.
So the next panelist is probably the one I know the best personally. Um, I, I was actually very um, lucky to try his uh, homemade muffins yesterday afternoon. So thank you for that again, Sam. <laughs> so um, Sam Mitchum, American diver, scientist, geo instructor. You're living and working in Mexico. Um, you've been living and working in Mexico for a couple of decades. So you also had a period where you went out and came back. Um, you're a founding member and current director of SINDAC. And you're involved in numerous collaborations with research institutes. You, you basically work a lot with scientists, with professors from a university. You work with Ed, for instance, would be something like that. Uh, you have a special interest in educating divers in the public and in gathering data in the caves and sharing it with the community at large, if I'm not mistaken. So could you maybe tell us a little bit more about the tools you use for that, the challenges you're meeting, and these kind of things? Sure. Yeah. So um, the uh, I don't know who's sharing my photos, but if they could uh, put I my believe first it's, uh, photo. Nora. Nora is our Nora, Mrs. you Roy. got them. So um, I think it's really important to to understand that cave exploration is a process, especially here in Mexico. And as everybody stated, I think there's some really common goals. It's the the first one would be the drone eight image there, uh, Nora, and. Uh, it's a process, and as everybody has explained so far, it's, it does involve a lot of logistics. It involves a lot of uh, effort to, to engage the community and gain permission. There's no unknown land. And so all of our exploration efforts here start with a walk in the jungle. And what you're seeing here is Cenote Esmeralda, which we consider to be really one of the crown jewels uh, a cenote, the cave entrance to uh, the Oshbelha cave system. And this is kind of a, a once in a lifetime experience to find something like this. Just to give you some perspective, Oshbelha is about, or uh, the cenote Esmeralda is about 120 meters uh, from one end to the other there. So it's quite large. And uh, Bill Phillips, who Brian and Jill know very, knew very well, unfortunately he passed away a couple of years ago, uh, Bill and I hiked out here in 1997. Uh, we'd seen it in an aerial photograph, and uh, it's pretty much every cave driver's dream come true. And, and what has ensued in the following 20 years is uh, a massive amount of exploration. Oshbelha, the cave system, uh, has swallowed up, uh, swallowed up several other surrounding caves, and we now estimate, we're not entirely sure, but we definitely have over well over 300,000 meters of, of surveyed cave passageway here. So it's, it's a massive cave system. And uh, there's a number of different challenges that come from that. And um, if we can go to the next picture, which is the underwater one, Laura, please. And um, so over the years, we've really tried to, to refine our techniques and our skills and um, kind of riffing off of Cenote Esmeralda. This is the Cenote that's just upstream from it. It's about a uh, 1,000 meters uh, upstream. It's called Yashkai. And Bill and I, in the original exploration that we did here, uh, came across this. And so one of the things we've always really tried to do is, is utilize whatever information is available to us and combine it with our own skills in diving plus whatever technology we can get into our hands. And so finding this cenote was actually a pretty good example of that. And uh, we had seen it also in an aerial photograph. We knew where it was in relationship to uh, the, the, where we were starting from in Esmeralda. Uh, and at that time, this is in 1998, uh, we didn't have Google Earth and uh, we just would print out the stick map of the cave on acetate and then lay it over on top of the aerial photograph at the same scale. And we could see where our exploration was going in relationship to uh, the cenote we were actually looking for. And in terms of kind of memorable and, and magical experiences that I've had in my diving career, uh, finding this cenote would be one of them because uh, when we emerged into it, you have to realize this cenote is just sitting out in the middle of the jungle. Uh, the fish had no idea absolutely what alien creatures we were. And when we kind of came out of the darkness and into the daylight, we were literally surrounded by all of these beautiful, curious fish. 
So um, using technology, uh, using available amounts of information over the years, we've really um, uh, developed different techniques that we use. Um, and if we could go to the last slide and, and kind of with this last slide, what I wanted to do is put before the rest of the panel, uh, I, th I don't think the challenges we face here are any different than, than many of the challenges you might face in what you're doing as well. Uh, and these have been persistent challenges for us over the years. Uh, number one is data management. Uh, and as you can imagine, with over 300,000 meters of, of cave, uh, for just one cave, uh, plus we're using drones now. So we have uh, aerial imagery that we're collecting. We have underwater video and photographs documenting what we find. And so the beauty of the day and age we live in is we have all this incredible technology that allows us to capture all this data. Uh, the difficulty is managing all of it. And so we're coming up with, we're, we're trying to be innovative. We're using geographic information system uh, to, to um, <clears throat> compile all that data and, and be able to show that data to the people that it matters to. Uh, and finally, our second really big challenge here, and I know Jill and Brian uh, particularly have worked uh, tirelessly to engage the public through books and documentary films. Um, the real challenge is making people care about something that they can't see. And uh, at the bottom of this, this photograph, uh, I kind of cheated here and put three photos together. Uh, <laughs> last year, we had the opportunity to work with a, a, a high resolution 360 camera. And um, I think one of the real uh, challenges, obviously, is, is most people are never going to go into the environment we go to. So how do we take them there safely and have them have the same experience that we do to some extent? And uh, the 360 camera, in my opinion, is uh, it's emerging nascent technology, uh, as are the VR goggles. The gentleman in the VR goggles there is one of the Sonoti owners that we go to quite often. And uh, we put imagery of what's beneath him, uh, literally, into the headset there. And uh, it was a mind-blowing experience for him. And so we're kind of hoping that that technology is going to help us move forward. Um, and at the bottom, if you want to see any of this, we've got three 360 videos now on our YouTube channel. And if you just go on YouTube and, and search Syndac AC, uh, you'll find our channel and we you, you can kind of check it out. And I would be very interested in anybody's feedback. I, I'm just learning how to uh, edit and stitch and put all these images together. So that's, oh, that's, um, that's fascinating. Yeah, that, that's great. I mean, like I've, I've seen firsthand the work you've been doing with the 360 videos and so on. And I think it's absolutely fascinating to be able to share our passion with people who cannot necessarily go there. Um, and it's important on a lot of different ways, because again, the collaboration with the public is extremely important with the landowners and also for conservation purpose, because you said it's hard for people to care about what they don't see. Now, we all know, I think for all of us cave divers, it's self-explanatory that you have to protect the caves because they're so beautiful. But if you don't show that beauty to people out there, then it's hard to get them on board for conservation efforts. So I think that what you're doing is, is really essential on that. Um, I'd like to ask a question to the whole panel right now and what you were saying, you know, you, you, you've had to find tools for data management, for engaging with the public. I'm pretty sure that's something that all of us have had to do. Obviously, you know, Brian and Jill have done that for much longer than most of us and have more experience, but we also have Robin who showed us how he was like managing the cave locations on Google Earth. Do you guys think that there would be a need to basically more global tools for everyone to use, like, you know, like a, a gigantic cave database? Would we need tools to be able to share the info together from different locations? Because each one of us is doing their own little cooking, I feel, sometimes with data management. Mm -hmm. You know, we reinvent the wheel permanently. So do you guys think that we could do something more global? And do you think it could be interesting to touch a broader public? Um, Absolutely. If I could. Hey, go ahead, Brian. Um, uh, so, no, so I mean, um, where Sam is going is working with GIS, and and that's exactly where that's going. That is public, and so Absolutely. when when you're talking that when you're talking about submitting your data and putting it into a GIS system, you're making it available for for everyone. There's all of us as explorers understand that there are some caveats to that 
Um, there are some sites that are uh, incredibly sensitive due to archaeology, biology, um, extremely fragile, and those types of things. So the what you put into that system has to be thought out, and the, the, the ramifications of that have to be considered as well. Absolutely. And, and for me, there is also one difficulty, as we all know, if you put five cave divers into a room, you will have seven different opinions on any given subject. So finding also like common tools and methods is a little bit tricky for that. Ben, I think you wanted to say something about that, about the, um, the necessity for sharing knowledge and um, having common tools. Absolutely. I mean, like Brian says, I think everybody's using different uh, mapping systems and so on. I'm, I'm still trolling around with Nemo. I'm very jealous of Jill for having seen the sunfish at uh, at work. Um, so I, I really like where this is going. We have some cave systems that are too deep or too big to be mapped by by hand. So yes, and I never heard of this system that Brian just talking about. So very interesting. Yeah, no, I agree. There is a lot of tools out there. And, you know, to go beyond this conversation between the panelists, I would actually encourage everyone here to actually exchange on that, because I'm pretty sure that each of us has found solutions that some of the others might not be aware of, you know, just stumbling across things. So I think that more collaboration on that data management and, and working on, you know, how we gather the data and present it to the public is important. And Brian, I totally agree with you that there is also a bit of um, a difficulty of what to share and what not to share, you know, not having an information overload, but also there is sensitive information. And so working all together on that to me is key. So it's not just collaboration with the community at large, but it's also between cave divers to, to choose what's relevant for the public and to basically make the best out of that so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Well, thank you very much, Sam. I think that's that's um, sure. very interesting. You know, look at that data management and technological aspect. Um, so thanks for sharing that. Um, now, if we move on to Brian. Brian, you just gave us you know your opinion about that and thank you very much. Um, very much like Jill, I don't think you need much of an introduction, but you know, just for um, for the public right now, you're a former U.S. Navy diver, and you have over 30 years of professional diving experience, right? Uh, you're an underwater photographer, writer, explorer, cave diving instructor, conservationist. I find it interesting that the longer you stay in the cave diving industry, to call it an industry, the more polytechnical you become. You know, it's like Jill, nobody nobody's just a cave diver, right? Because you need to touch so many different subjects to actually leave your passion to the fullest. And that's personally what I enjoy about cave diving, is that I end up doing a lot of things besides cave diving, which is, it cannot get boring at all. And I think your CV, Brian, really shows that very well. And you're the founder and director of the Bahamas Caves Research Foundation and pretty much the person to ask for any question related to caves in the Bahamas. So thank you very much to be on the panel with us today. And uh, would you like to present to us a couple of pictures to share your love of the caves with us? Sure. Thanks very much if Nora can help me out there. Um, I, th I think, you know, going back to that, that very diverse CV that a lot of us have, um, in order for us to, to, this all has culminated from being an explorer into being someone who wants to conserve these amazing places that we found. And so what, what's really happened is, is we've, we've really tried to uh, gather all of this information. We, we can't just go to the government of, of whatever country we're working in and say, oh, we found this very cool little critter. Um, uh, you can't hurt this cave because that one little critter uh, is, in that, is in that cave. And so it just doesn't work. Um, what you have to do is, and what I've done through photography and video and the documentaries and, and all of that is to try to get the big picture. I need all of the information, not just, you know, obviously the scientific information is, is important, but all of the, all of the information about where the cave is, what's on top of it, um, what impacts it might be, uh, people might be having on top of it. So all of the, all of these different parts of the CV are to get that big picture so that I can then take it to the government and say, this is why this is not just a hole in the ground where we throw our cars and our trash. It, it, we really have to have all the information. The picture you're looking at is uh, a, a great picture by Jill Heinerth, uh, who was part of one of our National Geographic uh, projects here in, uh, in Abaco in the Northern Bahamas where I live. The Bahamas is stretched out a very long distance. We have 700 islands and keys. Um, there are caves and or blue holes uh, all throughout these, these islands. And this particular cave system is one of the caves that I work in pretty much every day 
whether it's for research or guiding or teaching. And it's called Dan's Cave. Um, and it's been now been attached to another cave called Ralph's. Combined, we call them the Crystal Caves of Abaca. And so, again, trying to collect all of that data, just like 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 Sam and and everybody who's who's been working in these caves for forever, we have to show them what's there first. We have, they have to realize what it is that's there. And again, trying to get people, no one will conserve anything unless they are passionate about it. Of course, you're going to get lots of people who want to protect the koala bear. You're going to get lots of people who want to protect pandas, that type of thing. The caves are not warm and fuzzy and, and huggable and, and on the surface. So we have to bring it to them. And maps, of course, is the first step. I, I really believe that um, exploration and mapping is the first step in science. It is a scientific process. And it's that very first step. We can't study it unless we know it's there. And so um, here's a, a, a picture of Jill uh, or from Jill uh, showing me uh, doing some surveying. We've since moved on from the basic uh, compass and, and uh, slate and stuff like that. We are using Nemo and, uh, and different processes. We're using photogrammetry and, and all of those processes as well. Um, but once we establish that baseline, then we have to start bringing out stuff like this. We have to explain to uh, governments exactly why these places are special. This is a place in uh, Ralph's Cave. Uh, again, it's, it's all part of uh, Dan's cave or crystal caves now. And um, so this is called the roses. And from my, from my commercial standpoint, this is why people come to see us. They want to come and see this right here. And because there really is nothing like this anywhere. And it's the cool thing about the caves here is this is not just one little spot in the cave. Um, we're, this cave system is reaching up towards coming up on 50,000 feet right now. And it's one of the longest island caves found anywhere, really. And it's highly, highly decorated like this throughout. So the diversity that we have here in the Bahamas uh, due to our really pure limestone and the interactions of Saharan dust from Africa that's blown all the way across the Atlantic have created these amazing colors, extremely delicate and pure calcite formations. The fact that um, these are very uh, interactive with high and low sea level stands um, over the last 350,000 years, these caves have been dry caves uh, four times over the last 350,000 years. So this is all what has taken place to create these absolutely amazing places. And again, from the diversity standpoint, if you go to the next slide, um, we have the, the diversity of our systems are, are just incredible. We have these these beautiful, very uh, ramiform or very, very uh, intricate uh, solutional caves. But then we have these massive slum fault fracture caves um, found throughout the different islands. Um, just offshore, offshore in the Bahamas, we have a lot of deep water trenches. And when the sea level was lower than it is right now, about 120 meters lower than it is right now, these, these walls were just bluffs. And you, you could bring your boat up to the, to the edge of the island. You'd be looking 100 meters plus up this giant bluff. So instead of the wall of, the, of that bluff trying to calve off like a glacier uh, into the sea, it created these stress relief fractures that run parallel to these giant troughs, these giant canyons. And um, through normal dissolution processes with haloclines and, and uh, bacteria and sul sulfides and things like that, those cracks enlarged and got larger and larger and larger. And this particular crack, this is from what I call the Great Andros Fracture, uh, is over 100 miles long with dozens and dozens of openings throughout that. Some of the openings are in the land. Some of the openings are offshore. It's, that's all dependent upon what our current sea level is right now. So we're really fortunate to have these incredibly uh, diverse and oftentimes very deep, deep cave systems. We're looking at stuff that's over um, 140, 145 meters deep here. Um, and then we have a couple of anomalies that are even deeper than that. Uh, Dean's blue hole uh, over 220 meters, stuff like that. So um, it's an absolute playground. Uh, and for someone who's basically dedicated their whole life to it, like like myself, uh, it just really doesn't get much better than this. 
Now, this is this is really beautiful. I mean, that, something that I really like listening to you is that again, you, you've been at it for 25 years, and it just doesn't get old. You know, the sheer beauty of the cave is amazing. That's something that I really find fascinating. When I, I often go to caves and I feel like I'm basically strolling through the Guggenheim in Bilbao, looking at works of art. You know, just nature is the artist, and that's something that that I find absolutely amazing. You know, and um, that that just yeah. doesn't get old. So, thanks for never, sharing never. that beauty. You know, there is that picture um, of you in there that Jill has taken where you're um, basically surveying the cave by hand, right? And, you know, we've we've seen that um, there is a lot of other ways to do it, you know, using um, laser, 3D laser mapping. We have photogrammetry, we have all that stuff. So do you think that nowadays, um, like manual survey, manual mapping and so on still has a place in cave diving? Or do you think that now it's something obsolete? I mean, how do you feel about that? I think it's a transition. I, th I think we're yeah. we're in that transition now as the technology comes available. Sebastian Kirster has been magnificent in, in creating this Nemo Absolutely. and making sure it's getting into the right hands and also being available to all of us who are very challenged in computers uh, with endless uh, you know Skype calls and uh, texts and things like that of how to actually manipulate the data. He's been amazing. So I very few people who will stand behind their their stuff like that, where they're just totally dedicated to making sure that everybody understands how to use it. That they're getting very through. true. But if we connect that problematic to education, and that's a question for Sam, you know, um, I feel also that I've used the Nemo, you know, I've used that, like manual survey. I feel like even when you're using more complex tools, having an idea of what the survey is all about, you know, when it's more bare bone, it's probably important. So I would, I would maybe personally think that doing manual survey first to understand what a survey is all about, what data quality is, how important it is, you know, when you're learning, it's probably part of the process. So I'm not sure that going directly towards very advanced technological solution is always good, but maybe starting with a pencil somehow just gives you a better feeling for what the data should be. Sam, how do you feel about that? Uh, absolutely. I, uh, it's kind of a correlation. Uh, whenever I go in the jungle, I, I have a pretty high powered GPS these days, but I always take the compass and the topo map with me because the batteries on that GPS could run out. So technology is fantastic, but as cave divers, I think redundancy is something that we always have uh, literally in our back pocket. And so uh, we've done just to kind of uh, compound what, what Brian was saying there. The NEMO is just an incredible tool. We did over 100,000 meters of survey using NEMOs last year alone. And it's uh, an incredible tool that's allowing us to actually go back and resurvey sections of the cave and get more accurate data. And not only that, but also to uh, see areas that we missed in the original exploration. So in kind of a basic ratio for every one meter of cave that we're resurveying, we have almost one meter of new caves that we're exploring as a result. So uh, this technology is just fantastic. And I do believe that, as Brian says, we're in a, a moment of transition here. And I, you know, it, it's my theory is if I can imagine anything, someone's already been researching and developing it for probably 15 to 20 years. And so I can't, I can't wait for, what might come out of all of this and how it's going to progress because it always does. Yeah, that's great. You know, I, I, I like to hear that because right now we're living through challenging times with the crisis the world is going through. So hearing you being excited about the future for a change is a very different tone than what we read in the newspapers. So I find it very oh, refreshing. Totally. So that, you know. Cave diving is the Excellent. safest place to be right now. I agree. That's, you know, <laughs> conf confinement 101, you know, go as deep as you can into a cave. This is a lockdown. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, yeah. Thank you very much, um, Sam and Brian, for sharing um, your thoughts on that. Um, we're moving on to the um, last but not least um, panelist, uh, Ben. So thank you very much, Ben, for joining us. Um, just a short Thanks introduction. So you're originally from Belgium, but um, you've lived a little bit all over the place over the years. So you started your diving career in Egypt. You've lived in Mexico as well, if I'm not mistaken. Now you're based more or less full-time in Thailand, though you probably still travel a fair amount. Uh, you're the founder of Blue Label Diving, but uh, you're not bound to a desk yet, if I'm not mistaken. You still spend quite a few days in the water a year, around 300 days in the water a year, which I think is great, you know, not just like sitting there, but also like still being out there. 
Um, like Bruce, you were involved in the rescue effort for the Thai soccer team in um, 2018. And um, you also did something that I found interesting in your CV. You worked for almost a decade in a recompression chamber to basically um, optimize your knowledge of diving physiology and try to keep bettering yourself, which I think is a very important part of our job too, is that we can keep learning. There is always a new subject. There is always a new topic. There is always something out there where we can feel like a newbie. That's for me, part of the pleasure of cave diving. So could you tell us a little bit more about your passion for cave diving, you know, using the pictures you've prepared for us? Well, good evening, everybody. And um, like everybody has said, cave diving is our last frontier, you know, technology is, is uh, they're trying to go to Mars, but the technology can't properly map a cave uh, unless we buy one of Bill Stone's very expensive toys. Um, until then, uh, it, it stays this, uh, this challenge, you know, even, even animals can't go so much, so far into a cave. Many skeletons of animals are the proof of that. So it, it keeps being very exciting. Even in Thailand, every year we find something, some new cave passages or, uh, uh, connecting cave systems. So it stays a, a challenge. Um, I started a long time ago with technical diving in Egypt, and then it was, uh, the books of Rob Palmer and stuff, the first ones with uh, more more um, philosophy than uh, than actual physiology and so on. So I had no idea about the questions that were asked. And that's why I went working for um, uh, as a decompression chamber tender and operator to pick up some more knowledge and a whole new world uh, went open. Somehow there's a, a link missing between the, the world of medical uh, and, and the diving world. So it's, uh, it was filled in nicely. So back to cave diving, I think we're running a bit uh, short on time. So are you sharing my pictures or shall I? Ignore, I think you care of it. Thank you very much, Nora. There we go. Yeah, that's the one. So this is in 98, I think. And as I was living in Egypt, I heard from this magic, magical blue hole where everybody was dying and uh, got very interested, did a, a few dives, felt totally in love and still in love with blue holes. So I'm to keep bugging uh, Brian to come over and, uh, <laughs> and have a boat trip. But um, I did together with Lee Cunningham, uh, a few very deep dives to 150 meters and somehow there was no, no bodies to be found, just one. But so this this dive, um, uh, I went to 202 meters, and besides being a, a mind-blowing dive, this was a free descent. And as you can see, the equipment and my streamline and my trim is uh, was a bit different than it is nowadays. And at around 160 and 170 meters, that's where we found most of the uh, the bodies, most of them all on single tank on air. But I was I was flabbergasted that that. People could actually swim that far on a single tank of a right down to uh, 170 meters. Um, that was sort of the bottom of the blue hole, and it, it stays a magical place. And many people, like Nuno Gomez, have uh, come after me and went far deeper and so on. But at the time, it was um, people declared me uh, insane to go uh, without the line or something in a free descent to, to 200 meters. And that the police were standing next to the blue hole with my passport in their hand because they were sure that I was never going to return and um, um, I did and there we go people didn't stop dying after that uh, even with restrictions put in the Red Sea which is uh, a real shame so next picture please Um, this is in Thailand. This is a sinkhole called uh, Song Hong. It's literally in the middle of the country. And I think you can compare it a bit to Wakula. It's, it's enormous, uh, but it's quite deep. So today we still don't know where it's going and how big it is. The measurement at around 60 meters of the actual tunnel, uh, the diameter is roughly 200 meters in diameter. So it, it's crazy. You never see the other side if you dive here. It drops down to uh, about 80, 90 meters in, in the jungle, straight down, and then it continues horizontally. Uh, Craig Challen and Richard Harris came over to visit before the cave rescue happened, and we reached just short of 200 meters. 
Um, but this picture was taken two years before that, and we're still not sure why this halo clan, or whatever you want to call it, uh, this is Fred dropping to a halo clan at 165 meters. And below that, we found these uh, isopods, as we think it is, moving all over the place and orange bacterial colonies. And I was so excited. I asked a lot of marine biologists. They had no idea what it was. And then when I went back with uh, Craig and, uh, and Dr. Harry, um, the halo clan was gone. There was no isopod to be seen. There was crystal clear visibility. And uh, we laid another 200 meters of line. So right now, we about a half a kilometer in the cave uh, with a maximum depth of 200 meters. And we still have no idea how big this sinkhole is and where it goes. So we really need some serious electronics. The, because of this diameter, um, we be measuring with the NEMO uh, lines that are, uh, go in a, in a perfect circuit, uh, 10 meters deeper and deeper. But of course, swimming for about two kilometers, uh, even with scooter, at a depth of 70 meters is already quite big, and the lines are 80, 90, and 100. So in just in this sinkhole, we laid over five kilometers of line, with still not having a clue where it, where it's going. So which keeps my job interesting. So I, I, I mailed Bill Stone up for a sunfish, but I didn't get any reply. So maybe Jody <laughs> can do a good word for me. <laughs> Next picture, please. I actually had a, a picture of uh, Hell's Gate, but uh, the resolution wasn't uh, good enough and it's, it's, everybody knows Hell's Gate. So this is actually the total opposite side. It's Oyama Mine in Finland, and this must be my top five dives uh, ever done. Um, it's, a, it's a flooded mine, so it's not a cave. And just to get here, the wheelbarrow uh, is about an hour and a half of solid scootering. And, and the finish, they're, they're quite mad. They, they all have supercharged scooters. This you see a CUDA with I think triple lithium packs inside, and you, you nearly lose your, your loop when you go there. So it's an hour and a half of solid scootering on trimix in four degrees, and the visibility is it's unbelievable. And after this, you end up at this wheelbarrow, which is the opposite side of the Hell's Gate, which everybody probably knows. Um, so I thought this was a, a nice picture to put in. It's taken by Damien Severo, a good friend of mine, and. Um, after this picture, I turned around, gave one kick, and destroyed the visibility for all the rest. So that was the only picture taken uh, during this time. So, there we go. That's my uh, my three pictures of um, of, of fame. Thank you very much for sharing, man. That, that's great. Um, you know, and, and when I see your pictures, and most of them are basically right now about you know rather you know substantial depth and so on. I have a question for you about the fact that most of us on this panel are explorers, but we're also instructors. So I mean, educating people not only outside of the diving community but within the diving community is important for us. So how would you say um, that, how challenging would you say it is to end the disconnect between exploration and education? Because right now you're going and doing this exploration very deep. So do you think that um, there are very important key points to educate people how to go to these depths? What are the biggest challenges you're facing as an educator to basically train your dive bodies to do those explorations? It, it's, it's very hard because we get a lot of people that uh, they look at the depths you've been doing, they want to do it as well, they want to go deeper, be the teacher or some, some kind of thing. And, and see, after the, the advanced trimix course, there's no more levels, so you can't really stop them. Uh, and the way of doing that is, is basically make them a bit aware, or some people might call it make them scared, with, with real life scenarios, as in uh, things go wrong and you let them it's not just a skill that's finished in five seconds and your handshake and, and the whole dive, uh, like a loss of vision, uh, air sharing and stuff, and, and they have to get it, get out of the cave uh, with their bailout gas running low and so on. So they get a real reality check of, hey, this is this is no fun. This is really uh, hardcore stuff if this happens. And, and they go back to the drawing board and say, oh, before I do this, I, I, I need to get some uh, serious thoughts. Right. We, we try to implement a, a masterclass uh, but of course, it's not agency approved. It takes sort of people to, for trains and for expedition diving, but um, it's not easy because agencies are, are putting more and more restrictions on, on what you can do to, st to students. I mean, 20 years ago, I would let people breathe from a, 
a tank without regulator in, in, and without mask in the Red Sea. I, I can't do that anymore these days. Or even ripping off mask is already a, a bit of a liability these days. So it's not easy. Sure. Now, I, I believe also, you know, there is like an, an, an old school way of scaring people into understanding the risks. I know <laughs> that, you know, um, like when I bought my first motorcycle, the, the guy who sold me the motorcycle says I was 16, I think, you know, and the guy says, I, I hope you get scared without getting hurt. And that was basically yeah. his philosophy back then is like to get aware of the risk. You know, I hope you get scared without getting hurt. Um, in, in my training, and I think most of us try to do that, I, I'd like people to not get scared, you know, but still get an idea and an awareness of the danger of the caves, you know. So I believe that implementing very serious training and thinking about it is, is very important, you know, and, and thank you very much for also making clear that the kind of dives you're showing right now are dives that require a lot of dedication, a lot of training, a lot of serious thoughts, you know, you've been educating yourself for a couple of decades now to try to do that. So it's yeah. important also to put that out there, to tell the people that to go to these depths and do that kind of dive safely requires a lot of commitment, a lot of hard work, like like any domain of excellence. Well, it, it, it's, it's, I'm sure you will agree that it's, it's a fine line between, sorry, maybe maybe making scared is, is, is a bad wording, uh, making people um, gain respect for the environment that, that they're diving with. But still, not having them freak out when when they suck the last breath or the mask goes out. So they need to be a bit of flooding of the of the brain that after two three times of no gas or, or no mask, and they relax into it, which increases their survival chances without making them paranoid and 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 scared, like you say. So it, it's 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 a little Absolutely. bit of an art so teaching. The right mix between experience, letting them experience things, but also training them to avoid the risk in the first place. So, yeah, it's an art. And I agree that, you know, to me, exploration and education go hand in hand. You know, like at the end of the day, we're not training students. We're training our future dive buddies in a lot of ways, you know. So I like, I like looking at it this way, and it's very important to me as well. Good. Well, thank you very much uh, for um, participating to that, Ben. And I would like to thank all the panelists for joining that discussion. Um, I'm really happy that we got, you know, through a lot of deep divers' backgrounds to see how diverse and how interconnected cave diving is to a lot of other fields, to a lot of other sciences, to a lot of other social aspects as well, you know, seeing that cave diving is really about places, it's about people, it's about what we do out there. And this is something that is extremely important for me. So thank you very much for tuning in. Thank you to the Indians, audience as well to come to us and listen to that. I hope you learned something about cave diving. I believe that on the Facebook of uh, ADEX, you will be able to get more information about the different panelists. So if you want to contact anybody on the panel, I think you can do. I'm pretty sure that all of us are open to questions from the public. We're all very, you know, like reachable and we're always happy to answer questions from cave divers, non-cave divers alike. Thank you very much for participating everything, everybody. I hope you had as much fun as I did. Yep. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thank you, Thank Thank you for you having me. So Thanks, Thanks yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Julian, for moderating for us for this session. And um, I guess um, thank you very much for all your time. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye. This is underwater rugby. It's basically rugby. With fins and still shoes. A ball that sinks, not close.